Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're, uh, we're delighted you're here. Uh, this is a, a rare opportunity that brings Ernie and me back together in each other's company. We worked together, gosh, how many years ago already? This was back when, when I, was, I was younger and you were good looking. I mean, I don't know how all that works out. I mean, As we said, know. it was a political configuration soon to be re revisited. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, said it's, it's a political configuration soon to be revisited because we got to know each other back in 1994. And of course, Congress changed hands and things got really rock 'em sock 'em back then. So it was, uh, we're, we're, we're both just rejoicing that we're not in government right now. I mean, I hate to say that. <laughs> Actually, it's, uh, it's one of the great. Uh, advantages that think tanks and universities uh, bring to uh, America, the idea landscape, is the capacity to think freshly and to think freely. You know, I think one of the great problems that, that governments have these days is that it's very hard to explore new ideas without them becoming politically dangerous. You know, and as soon as you just open up the idea you're thinking about it, it immediately becomes the substance of rancorous political debate as people are trying to score points on each other. And this is one of the, one of the real dilemmas that we have, uh, modern America has, is how, how do we explore new ideas for a national policy direction uh, and get it past this bear pit of Washington? You know, and it's pretty hard for the government to do that kind of thinking. And uh, thankfully, we have fabulous institutions like MIT and, uh, that are able to do some of this for us. Um, uh, this is part of a remarkable series that MIT has done on energy. Uh, you know about their coal work. Uh, you know about uh, the, uh, the this the nuclear project. Of course, has been one of the early ones. It's been your first one was what? Nuclear, nuclear power, two thousand three. You know, and so it's it's substantially uh, shaped the landscape of the uh, ideas industry. I mean, we've been thinking and discussing, debating, affirming things that were in that study. But I would say that the policy world shaped where the policy world meets the political world. Uh, it has not. We've not seen that kind of progress. We've seen, if anything, very static intellectual environment. But that's now changing. Uh, we don't know how it's going to go. I mean, it's changing fairly profoundly. We've just, as everyone knows, we've shut down work on uh, what Senator Chick Hecht once described as the nuclear suppository. Out in, uh, <laughs> we think he simply was confused. Um, but there's an open debate about that. Um, but then, okay, what does that mean? The Sven joke. Oh, the spend would have been better. The, uh, but what does that mean? And, uh, you know, for, what, 30 years, we've had kind of a worldview that there's an open fuel cycle and a closed fuel cycle, and people have taken positions. You know, it's a little like World War I. You know, everybody's in their trenches. Everybody's got their guns. We're ready to fire as soon as we see any movement, right? Well, I mean, we really need to put ourselves in a new space. We need to think a little bit more freely. And it's something so hard to be done politically. You know this, Pete, from your experience. You know? So what we need to do is uh, try to bring forth people who have been thinking about this, bring them into the policy landscape in Washington to start an honest debate where you still have a chance to think. You know, sooner or later, it's going to be where people will stop thinking and just simply argue for their position. But let's use this as an opportunity to think together. And Ernie, I want to say thank you to you. We've been friends for quite a few years. We've enjoyed uh, this. I've learned a lot from you. I don't think you've learned much from me, and that, but that's not because of you. Uh, and uh, this is going to be an extension of that today from you and your colleagues. And thank you all for being here. And let me turn it to you, Ernie. Why don't you get us started? Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, well, I forgot I, after you I put the microphone down quite a bit, but uh, um, that was very uh, gracious and John and I, as you can probably get a hint there, have certainly had a lot of fun over the last uh, 15 years and uh, John has been, of course, an enormous contributor to our national security uh, concerns um, in so many roles. Um, I do have one uh, housekeeping thing to say. I, I believe on the, on the uh, uh, open line, we have uh, some press, and I would just ask that uh, uh, please put your phones uh, on mute for the moment, and then in the Q and A, we'll we'll turn to the uh, disembodied voices of of the distant uh, distant press. <laughs> 
Um, thank you uh, very much for uh, coming here today. Uh, we've been working at this uh, future of nuclear fuel cycle study for um, <laughs> two to three years, let's say, uh, somewhere in that range. When I'll describe the, the, the group a, a little bit. Um, uh, as John mentioned, uh, we've had a series of these uh, future of nuclear power, future of coal, future of natural gas, uh, soon future of solar energy, uh, future of the grid, uh, studies where we try to combine a rigorous uh, a technically grounded analysis uh, in the end with a view towards policy steps uh, that can help uh, enable these technologies uh, to be major contributors in the energy mix, uh, addressing climate and addressing security, addressing all of our energy needs. So um, uh, we will try, we hope we have brought that focus uh, to this set of questions around the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, we've revisited nuclear uh, uh, because since 2003 there have been a lot of changes, uh, some such as uh, clearly increased uh, nuclear power deployment uh, globally, uh, some like uh, I would maintain a heightened uh, sensitivity and concern about climate change risk, but also a lot of confusion. Uh, Yucca Mountain was just mentioned uh, by, uh, by John Hamry. We've had GNEP. We've had uh, a lot, lot of recycling discussions. And so we just thought this was a, a very timely uh, uh, contribution that we could hopefully make uh, to the debate. So let me um, first note that, as I said, we have a, uh, a, a large group uh, at MIT. Uh, uh, my colleagues here, uh, Charles uh, Forsberg, first, he's the ex executive director of the study, Professor Mujid Kazemi, uh, co-chair uh, of, of the study. I'd also I'd li like to recognize uh, two other members that I at least see here, John Parsons in the back there, who put his hand up to, to note that he's the economist. Uh, here in the front, uh, Monica Reglobudo, who was a visiting scientist in nuclear engineering. Uh, I believe she spends some time at Argonne National Laboratory uh, as her day job, uh, but was a visitor at, on fuel cycle, uh, fuel cycle technologies. If I've missed anyone, uh, please uh, 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 announce yourself. Uh, I'll just mention that on the right, uh, names that probably none of you recognize, but will in 10 or 20 years, are the students who actually did, it, did all the work. Uh, so it's been uh, a great, great uh, effort uh, crossing many, many uh, disciplines. Uh, we also have had uh, an outstanding uh, advisory committee uh, chaired by, uh, by Phil, former Congressman uh, Phil Sharp, uh, now president's, uh, President of Resources for the Future. A um, uh, number of other names who you recognize. I think uh, Dick Meserve is there, uh, one member of our advisory committee, uh, and um, uh, Dick will be ha happy to answer questions uh, later on about the <laughs> report. Um, let me uh, also note that we had a, a series of sponsors. Uh, uh, EPRI was our, our lead sponsor, but uh, many other sponsors, Idaho, uh, NEI, Arriva, GE, Westinghouse, Energy Solutions, and NAC. Uh, we appreciate the support very much. I do want to emphasize that neither the advisory committee nor the sponsors are necessarily uh, well, they're not responsible for uh, all of the conclusions and recommendations, although I, th I do think that, th that we have a good alignment. Uh, and finally, let me just note that I think, uh, uh, well, we are extraordinarily uh, happy with this wonderful turnout and a lot of old friends uh, can see here. Uh, but let me also just recognize in particular uh, Pete Miller uh, here, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy, uh, including uh, now bringing un into his embrace uh, the responsibilities for waste management and Principal Deputy uh, Pete Lyons, uh, who many of you also know from uh, the NRC uh, in, a, in a previous incarnation, uh, et cetera. So, and I'm going to one more. I, I think I see Senator, my eyes are not good, but Senator Johnston, Bennett Johnston, uh, who is an advisor on everything, even if not listed, uh, is also here. So anyway, with that, oh my God, and my old boss Jack Gibbons now is here as well. Uh, so this, uh, we had better move on, I think, to the, uh, to, to the questions at hand. What we're going to do is uh, go the following way. Uh, I will do a quick run through kind of a high-level narrative of our main conclusions, findings, uh, some recommendations, try to go through that fairly quickly. Uh, and then uh, Charles and Mujid are going to come up and go into more depth into three of the essential issues uh, 
that underpin uh, these recommendations, not all, but three of them on uranium resources, the questions of long-term storage, and then the questions of uh, fuel cycle uh, uh, evolution and choices, okay? So uh, let me just start with that, again, quick, uh, <clears throat> quick narrative, and then we'll have hopefully plenty of time for, for Q&A. Um, so the first thing is that uh, uh, for the next several decades uh, in the United States, uh, the once through fuel cycle using light water reactors is the preferred economic option and frankly, given time constants for change in the nuclear business, uh, uh, is uh, pretty much uh, what will happen uh, certainly for s some period. Uh, the, uh, this is uh, underpinned uh, by uh, several uh, important points. By the way, we do go back to the statement that in the end, the analyses are most interesting, of course, in looking at a growth scenario uh, where nuclear power might, might scale up substantially over the next half century and century. Uh, in that context, uh, it still remains uh, a recommendation we made in 2003 uh, that the most important issue for moving in that direction would be building some set of first mover plants in the United States, and so accelerating the implementation of that program. Uh, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that that is uh, that is, of course, critical. But we're going to be moving on, uh, certainly in this briefing, and focus more on these questions of, of the fuel cycle. There's no shortage of uranium resources. That will be gone into in much more depth. Uh, reiterate that the basic scientific, the scientific basis for geological isolation and the management of, sp of spent nuclear fuel is sound. So we feel confident that uh, this will be implemented. Would also reemphasize that the resource extension and the waste management benefits of what we'd call limited recycling, kind of the once through MOX, is very, very minimal. And we do not, uh, therefore, suggest that that would be a near term uh, approach. And finally, comment that f fuel cycle transitions, and this will be uh, uh, reinforced quantitatively by Mujid, they just take a very, very long time. And with the uh, presumed, the pathway presumed for a long time, plutonium fed, um, high conversion ratio, fast reactors, um, we would be having many LWRs required to be built to service a growth based upon that technology. And secondly, in a growth scenario, Dynamically, in this century, there would be rel very little difference, not very, I mean, I don't mean like 30%, I mean not orders of magnitude difference in things like transuranic inventories uh, and uranium needs. Now, on the transuranic inventories, this will be discussed. They may be in very different places uh, in, the, in the fuel cycle, but the total inventories are not materially different. That's all in kind of reinforcing this high-level message on the once-through fuel cycle. Second, uh, we believe that planning, that is a planning horizon of the order of a century, should be built in to our fuel cycle design for managed or interim storage. That this is uh, a uh, optimum way of thinking about the fuel cycle going forward. It doesn't mean that you couldn't do something else before 100 years uh, if you decided to go to a repository, if you decided to, to, uh, to reprocess. But as a planning horizon, we feel, first of all, it is very important to build considerations of storage time into your architecture, and we feel a century or so is the right uh, kind of scale. Besides having things like cooling off fuel, uh, this, uh, this can and should preserve options for disposal, reprocessing, and recycle. And why are options important? Because there are major uncertainties. The major uncertainties are societal, such as what's the growth trajectory of nuclear power, which has an enormous Im implication for how you would choose a fuel cycle going forward. What are your nonproliferation norms, et cetera? And there are also technical uh, issues 
uh, including with closed fuel cycles. Maybe thermal reactors end up being a, an approach. Maybe you uh, go to low conversion ratio, which we will uh, basically recommend. Um, maybe you go to different ways of starting your fast reactors. We would suggest that today we really don't know whether spent nuclear fuel from light water reactors is a resource or a waste in terms of future optimal fuel cycle choices. One technical point, uh, and again this will be gone into in more detail, is that uh, conversion ratio of 1 or 1 plus epsilon uh, is sustainable and has advantages as one thinks about the dynamics of fuel cycle development uh, uh, over, the, over, the, over the century. Uh, in fact, the presumption of 35 years ago or so uh, that high conversion ratio uh, was, was important really limited and constrained the, the, the technology choices. Uh, and, uh, and the opening up of that technology space uh, allows for many other uh, pathways, some of which could have major implications in the policy world, such as the possibility of starting fast reactors with uranium, relieving your constraints of feeding the beasts with plutonium, not forcing further light water reactor uh, uh, construction, and then treating spent nuclear fuel as a waste. We're not saying that is the pathway, but that's an example of a very, very different technology pathway, not a big stretch from what we're talking about technically uh, that has quite different implications. In fact, we would feel that in the nuclear business, and this goes back, uh, and Senator Johnston uh, was there, uh, uh, this goes back to uh, the dynamics of setting off in the fuel cycle uh, directions in the United States. Uh, was one in which we chose a constrained pathway in terms of requirements, whereas would argue in many businesses, maintaining options inexpensively has enormous value. And this is what this does uh, uh, fundamentally. And finally, in terms of these f highest level first messages and waste management, clearly geological isolation uh, uh, disposal is going to be needed for any fuel cycle uh, choice, and we should, uh, we certainly advocate uh, moving as aggressively as we can uh, to resolve uh, issues like repository uh, siting uh, with a public process. But our, uh, our, we want to make a few other points. One is that uh, in the United States, our choices about different parts of the fuel cycle have been made largely independently, when in fact there are strong reasons uh, to link those decisions together. Uh, the repository, the geology, the geochemistry, the waste forms, uh, the fuel forms, uh, the reactor, etc., should all be thought of uh, uh, in an in integrated way. It, there are material consequences for not doing so, and the history of Yucca Mountain uh, can be explored to exemplify uh, some of those consequences. Uh, secondly, our uh, waste management system is uh, rather unusual uh, in that it has uh, in many cases, uh, pathways defined by source of the waste as opposed to composition and risk in the waste. This has led to uh, orphans in our system. Uh, it will lead to more orphans uh, as we go forward. Uh, we need to move to a risk-defined waste management classification uh, and, uh, and, and system. Uh, we also talk about a set of characteristics uh, that we believe an effective waste management organization should have. And, and these, are, these are drawn not only from pure thought, but also from experience in Sweden and other countries. Things like uh, the ability to engage in site selection in concert with governments and communities, uh, management of the funds, uh, the ability to negotiate uh, removal of waste and spent fuel, uh, the ability to engage in policy and regulatory bodies uh, in, uh, on fuel cycle choices and waste. I mean, up to now, it's just been assumed you, we think of a wonderful fuel cycle and the waste will get taken care of. What we're concerned about is what goes back to the reactor. Well, that's, right. that's not right. We need to have a view of what's happening with the waste streams. Continuity of management. Uh, we would observe that none of these characteristics are recognizable uh, in our 
uh, program uh, at least up to date, and that does lead us to recommend a quasi-government waste management organization if it can be invested with these kinds of authorities. It makes no point to do it without providing the authorities. And I'll just finally comment, those are kind of the, I would say, the main, that's the main uh, uh, gestalt, but let me comment briefly on two other issues and then turn it over to Charles and Mujid. Uh, Nonproliferation, a uh, uh, very important issue uh, to which the responses are principally uh, institutional. Uh, we do advocate some version of, uh, of fuel leasing, but let's just emphasize here in this fuel cycle discussion uh, that the absence of functioning waste management programs in the United States and in other major supplier countries is a real constraint on our nonproliferation and security policy development because fundamentally in any form of fuel leasing, let's call it, involving small programs, the supplier is engaged in managing the waste, uh, the spent fuel from the reactor. So just a, a, to point out that in the security world as well, the inability to resolve waste management is a serious, serious constraint. And finally, on the, on the R&D side, R&D&D side, first of all, especially since uh, Pete Miller and Pete Lyons are here, we want to say that the, uh, uh, it's objectively the case, that we think that the 2010 roadmap that DOE has produced has been a major step forward uh, in terms of ordering priorities along the strategic questions that we face in developing nuclear power. So it's not abandoning issues, uh, certainly of fast reactors and advanced fuel cycles, but we need to work, for example, light water reactors is the workhorse. We have a lot we could do in terms of improving light water reactors and fuels, et cetera. Uh, and I would say, uh, truth in advertising at MIT, we are a partner uh, in the simulation hub, for example, established at Oak Ridge. Very, very important initiative focused on improving light water reactors and their contributions uh, to nuclear power. So we are, we are very supportive uh, uh, of that. Uh, the, uh, we, in the end, recommend uh, about a billion dollars a year uh, as an appropriate uh, uh, R&D budget, with about a third of that dedicated to rebuilding or building a research infrastructure without which the kinds of things that we're talking about can't happen. Uh, so that, we believe, is, is, is a program. We all understand uh, these are not exactly flush times uh, in the congressional appropriations process, uh, but we think this is the kind of scale that we need to build up pretty quickly if we're going to use the time wisely in the next one or two decades to establish the technology space, narrow down. The time will come for large-scale demonstrations, uh, but right now we think there are many, many options to be defined. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Charles and, and, and Mujid, and then we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. I'm going to discuss two subjects today, uranium resources and spent fuel storage. At first, I'd like to uh, discuss our conclusions on uranium resources. Our basic finding is there's no shortage of uranium that might constrain future commitments to build new nuclear plants for much of the century. Having said that, the central importance of understanding uranium resources is sufficiently high that we recommend an R&D program to provide a higher confidence in our projections of uranium resources uh, for the remainder of this century. Now, we did a cost assessment of uranium resources versus cumulative use. I'd like to mention a couple of the highlights. Now, some background information. First, a light water reactor needs about 200 tons a year. And the cost of this uranium is 2 to 4 percent of the cost of the electricity, 2 to 4 percent. And that means that uh, substantial increases in uranium prices, 50 to 100 percent, have small impacts on the cost of electrical power from a nuclear power plant. You know, a 50 percent increase in the uranium cost is, you know, a 1 to 2 percent increase in the cost of electricity. Very important point to understand. Second. We evaluated the cost of uranium mining versus cumulative uh, worldwide uranium production. The inputs for our assessment included uranium resources estimated versus ore grade, the economics of scale, 
and technological learning over a period of a, of a long time of decades or centuries. Last, I'm just going to give one single point of uh, comparison. Our best estimate is, is that a 50% increase in uranium cost, that is about a 1% or 2% cost increase in the cost of uh, nuclear power, uh, would occur if, you, if the nuclear enterprise worldwide expanded by a factor of 10 and all of those reactors operated for a full century. Gives you a quantitative feel of what our assessment was. Now I'd like to point to some other experimental data that I think you may find very interesting. As you know, uranium's a metal like copper, zinc, nickel, iron, cobalt. And if you take a look at the prices of 25 metals over the last century, you see this curve which shows the time and the uh, dollars per ton of various, uh, various uh, metals, inflation adjusted over time. Now obviously you cannot read that, those fine lines from where you are in the audience, but the noteworthy feature about all of this cost data over a century is that the prices, inflation adjusted, have not increased for all of these particular metals. And in many cases, such as in copper, the production of those metals went up by a factor of 100 or a factor of 1,000 in a century, and yet the price did not. And of course, this reflects technological learning and a variety of other factors, factors that we think are also applicable to uranium. With that brief discussion, I would now like to turn to the broader issue of spent fuel management. Our basic finding? Spent fuel storage reduces repository cost and performance uncertainties. Fuel cycle transition times require a half century or more. And storage provides the time to decide whether LWR spent fuel is a waste or a resource. And because of those three factors, we've come to the recommendation that planning for long-term interim storage of spent nuclear fuel on the scale of a century should be an integral part of fuel cycle design. You may not, in fact, keep it in storage for a century. You may make a decision in 10 or 20 years, but the planning basis, planning basis should be on the, on the uh, time frame of a century. Let me go a little further into details of why we came to that conclusion. First issue. Repository programs spo store spent fuel to reduce repository size, cost, and performance uncertainties. As shown to the, in the graph to the right, the decay heat from spent fuel decreases with time. And as that decay heat decreases with time, the cost of your repository goes down, the size of your repository goes down, and your performance uncertainties go down. In short, because of this, every repository program in the world has concluded that spent fuel should be stored for 40 to 60 years before disposal. And countries that carefully thought through the fuel cycle, Sweden with the once through fuel cycle, France with the partial recycle, built spent fuel storage facilities in the 1980s with the explicit goal to store that spent fuel for several decades before disposal or other operations. In short, it was viewed as a requirement, a requirement, a technical requirement for waste management. In fact, we have the same requirement in the United States. Let's take a look at the proposed Yucca Mountain repository system. Now, as you know by law, this is a repository. It's not a spent fuel storage facility because it's been declared a repository by law. But let's take a look at what was sent in as the licensing document to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The operating schedule for this repository is that we would spend three decades filling it. And for the following 50 years after the repository was filled, we would keep the tunnels open and operate the ventilation systems to cool the spent fuel. Cooling the spent fuel, storing the spent fuel until the decay heat decreased. In effect, Yucca Mountain would become a repository when the fans were shut off and the repository was closed, which would be a minimum 50 years after the last ton of spent fuel went into the repository. So although the sign says repository on the door, the technical reality, the technical characteristics of spent fuel drove the designers to have, in effect, a 50-year underground storage capability built into Yucca Mountain. 
Second observation, of which uh, Professor Kazumi will address, it takes 50 to 100 years for a fuel cycle transition. If we talk about fuel cycle transitions, a century is the time frame of relevance. And I will uh, leave it to Professor Kazumi to go into that in thir additional detail. Last, it will be decades before we know whether LWR spent fuel is a valuable resource or a waste. LWR spent fuel, of course, has a high energy content. It is equivalent to a super strategic petroleum reserve. And that says we should be cautious before we throw it away. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that spent nuclear fuel, LWR spent fuel in particular, could be a waste. There are alternative strategies to start up fast reactors, sustainable, sustainable fuel cycles using low enriched uranium. And we have some reasons to believe that these alternative strategies may be more economic, and if they're more economic than an LWR, in fact, becomes, spent fuel becomes a waste. A couple of other conclusions on spent fuel, particularly spent fuel at decommission sites. We made the following finding. The burden of spent fuel storage is small at an operating site. However, this is not true for decommissioned sites where there are no longer normal reactor operations associated with spent fuel handling, storage, and security. In addition, spent fuel storage limits reuse of these sites. These sites have valuable characteristics, transmission grids, availability of water, good transportation. And the spent fuel storage on a decommissioned site limits the future use of those particular sites. Because of these considerations, we recommend that the U.S. move towards centralized spent fuel storage start sites, starting initially with spent fuel from decommissioned sites and in support of a long-term spent fuel management strategy. I would now like to briefly talk and discuss spent fuel storage options. A central finding, either distributed storage, that is at the reactor, or centralized long-term storage, or storage in a repository. A retrievable, re retrievable repository is technically sound, so there are at least three major options with different policy and, impl and economic implications. And we, and we need to recognize that we have choices, choices here. There's not just one choice for spent fuel storage. Having said that, we also have a recommendation, and that is we recommend an RD and D program should be devoted to confirm and extend the safe storage and transport period. We believe storage is safe for a very long time, but all of the supporting experimental data required to give high confidence in those conclusions does not currently exist, and that's a prudent practice, like looking at uranium resources, is to take a look at this and make sure we have a high confidence level in terms of long-term policies. Uh, with that, I will turn it to Professor Kazumi, who will describe the results of some of our systems analysis studies. Um, as you can tell, my two colleagues uh, said, uh, we don't want to deal with numbers, you deal with them. <laughs> so um, I hope I don't bore you, but uh, I'm going to describe the results of a system simulation of the nuclear energy uh, evolution over a century, uh, starting from roughly where we are today. And the uh, focus is, of course, on the U.S., uh, but uh, we do keep in mind the international conditions as uh, uh, we get to certain parts of this. Um, the, it is important to realize that uh, uh, very few times did we take a look at the whole thing in our choices for the future in order to make the right choices for optimizing the entire system. More often, uh, the evolution of our energy uh, uh, source has been uh, uh, optimized by a component, you know, light water reactor, this is the way, best way to do it, the fast reactor, this is the best way to do it, the repository, this is the best way to do it, and the fact of the matter is every decision that's important in one component will have an effect on the other components, and system studies have to be part of the overall assessment of the evolution of nuclear energy, and what are we concerned about? We're concerned about, you know, the availability of the fuel resource, uh, how much uh, transuranics uh, are being produced, uh, and uh, uh, what, what sort of infrastructure for the industry uh, for recycling that we have to build in, and so forth. So this is the characteristics that we'll be pointing out from the results of our study. 
uh, we had to concentrate on few choices. There are many variations that one can uh, interrogate, and in fact, uh, we have done uh, some variations. But the main uh, fuel cycles that we looked at are uh, the um, today's reactors, light water reactors with an open uh, fuel cycle from mined uranium, uh, the um, limited recycle in thermal reactors, uh, a la, say, the French way, where you get plutonium recycled in light water reactors. Or uh, you can look for fast reactors to do some recycling in the future. Depending on the desired objective, uh, you have to design the reactor to either be a burner of plutonium with a conversion ratio of 0.75, or a self-sustaining reactor with a conversion ratio of 1, or a breeder which can produce more energy than, uh, more fuel than it consumes, and we looked at a GE-produced design in the past, all of which were metal-fueled reactors, and we think use the same principles, and therefore they have a consistency in between them. Um, there are many assumptions that have to be applied when you uh, do a system studies. I will not bore you with uh, discussing all of them, but uh, we assume that the range of growth in nuclear energy realistically is going to be between 1% and 4% over the century. Um, you could argue uh, that maybe you know, some, some, some higher numbers could have been used, but um, uh, still, 4% uh, percent means that uh, you need to add four reactors per year today, maybe 10 reactors per year in 2050. And uh, that's a considerable uh, addition. Uh, the advanced reactors will come at a later time for MOX recycling, we said 2025. For fast reactors, we said 2040. And we played with the timing for introduction of those. And there is some effect, but frankly, in the overall system, it's not a big one. Uh, another important uh, consideration is we did assume that uranium will be recycled uh, with uh, plutonium for the fast reactors. So uh, the numbers that you will see reflect uh, uranium recycling as well as plutonium recycling. So if you look at the uh, demand uh, for uh, nuclear energy under the three, scenario, uh, three scenarios, you see some numbers here uh, with uh, the various fuel cycle choices. Uh, let's concentrate on the medium uh, or the base case of 2.5% growth. And um, that uh, means approximately 250 gigawatts in 2050. Uh, if we were to turn to MOX in 2025, only about 40 gigawatts would come from MOX. And if we start uh, the uh, fast reactors in 2025, only about 20 gigawatts will come from fast reactors. Whereas, of course, at the end of the century, much more will come from the fast reactors. But notice that under any scenario, uh, two observations. Under any scenario we have here, uh, fast reactors will supply no more than half, actually less than half, the total energy uh, at the end of the century. So the light water reactors are with us for the entire century and they are the backbone of the system as it develops. As you can see here, this is how much installed light water capacity is increasing all the time, no matter what scenario we are uh, uh, addressing. The other thing that I should point out is there is very little difference in terms of penetration or demand for uh, uh, the advanced technologies uh, between building them with a self-sustaining conversion ratio of one, that's the middle number uh, in the uh, fast reactor rows, uh, or the last number to the right, uh, which is the breeder that can produce 1.23 uh, times the fuel that it consumes. So the difference, uh, and the implications being then when you look at the uranium needs, is that there will be little difference in the reduction for you, the uranium that would be needed by the end of the century between building a, a self-sustaining conversion ratio of one reactor and a breeder conversion ratio of 1.23 reactor. There are technical reasons for it, and maybe we'll get into it in the discussion, but uh, uh, the assumption that has been made long time ago that the fast reactor technology is best going after the highest possible breeding ratio turns out to be not necessarily uh, needed. And uh, one of the reasons why 
one wants to look at a uh, conversion ratio of one or self-sustaining reactor is that there are more types of reactors that can accomplish this than going to the highest uh, ratio for uh, conversion. So um, rather than confining our choices of technology by going to the largest breeding ratio, perhaps we are better off looking at a number of options for a self-sustaining reactor. Uh, the other thing that you notice is that the size of the recycling uh, uh, infrastructure that's needed is about the same no matter what the uh, choice of the fast reactor mission is. Uh, it's roughly speaking, you know, uh, this is of course uh, recycling of spent fuel from light water reactor and recognizing that uh, there's only 1% plutonium in the light water reactor spent fuel, um, you, you need to process essentially in order to get all the plutonium out to fuel any fast reactor that is starting with, with the plutonium. Uh, in fact, if we depend on MOX alone, uh, towards the end of the century, you will need a larger industrial infrastructure for recycling. Um, if you look at the uh, total uh, transuranics in the system, uh, the variation between the once through system, which is the black line, and the best uh, of these systems, uh, which is actually the uh, burner, uh, the blue line of a conversion ratio of 0.75, you can see that it is within about 30%. So um, it, the total through in the system varies somewhat according to uh, the advanced reactor or the advanced cycle that's adopted. But if we go after a breeder of 1.23, notice that the total through in the system even exceeds the ones through system uh, when you look at the total, meaning uh, what's in the reactor, what's in the uh, cooling uh, pools, uh, and uh, what's in the manufacturing, and so forth. So um, if the purpose of the introduction of the advanced technology is to reduce the transgenetic burden in the system, we have to be careful uh, about the technology that is chosen, and the impact is going to be relatively small, even with the best burner that one can have. Uh, the, this just shows that uh, we go from a system where through is dominantly in interim storage, that's the orange uh, area, to um, where it is in the needed cooling storage, this is the green area, our uh, code or our uh, model assumes a minimum of uh, five years of storage is needed before we can recycle. And the uh, uh, second uh, largest inventory is in the cores of the fast reactors, which is the red uh, area, as you see. Uh, so uh, what, what if we uh, attempt to go away from the traditional ways that we have been thinking about for fast reactor introduction and we look for enriched uranium as a way to start the fast reactor? This goes along with the idea that we only need to be uh, on the self-sustaining side. So the enrichment needed with the uranium to start fast reactors is within the commercially acceptable uh, limit of 20%. That's possible to do then, and, and within that range, uh, you, so you find that we can introduce more fast reactors because we're not constrained by the availability of plutonium, and we end up, in fact, saving more uranium by the end of the century by starting fast reactors with enriched uranium as opposed to plutonium. This has some policy implications, of course, that we know about. Should we go after recycling technology now or in the future? Or can we even dispense with it because uh, it might be that what we have as spent fuel is only a small fraction of the total uranium that's available uh, globally. So I won't go through all the conclusions. I think that uh, uh, I've said many conclusions already, but I, I do want to say that we've done a lot of sensitivity analysis and uh, perhaps the, it's important to point out that the controlling factors in the evolution of the system are the rate at which a nuclear uh, power uh, will be needed or will be growing. And the second one is uh, if we're going to go with the traditional uh, uh, plutonium initiated reactors is the availability of the fuel to initiate the advanced technologies.
Uh, the industrial details of the infrastructure play a role, but it's a smaller one, uh, when to start and the uh, appropriate capacity, whether it's a 500 metric ton per year or a 1,000 metric ton per year, makes smaller difference. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is that uh, uh, we really need a uh, system analysis uh, study with more details that assess the role of self-sustaining reactors of different technologies so that we are able to move forward with a more robust, perhaps, uh, technology for uh, uh, closing the fuel cycle and making uh, the uh, uh, nuclear energy available for uh, a long time in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, uh, Charles Majid. Um, I hope you get a flavor then of the uh, uh, directions that we uh, think are important, and the floor is open for questions. We'd appreciate it if you could identify uh, uh, yourself, and then uh, one of us will respond. Tom, say who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Cochran, NRDC. Uh, I have some problems with your analysis. Uh, in what you omitted. Principally, uh, you did an, a good analysis of uranium costs projected into the future on the basis of the history, but you did not do the same for either reprocessing or capital costs of reactors and the, more importantly, the capital cost difference between fast reactors and light water reactors. And I would just point out that the cost of reprocessing in 1970 was $30 a kilogram, about $150 a kilogram in today's dollars. It's gone up by an order of magnitude. Reactor costs the same way. So had you considered those factors, you wouldn't have in your analysis, systems analysis the need for fast reactors and uh, MOX recycle and so forth, which you could do a parametric study, you would, at least you would call to the reader's attention the fact that uh, fast reactors are priced out of the market and you see no way that they will get back into the market. Otherwise, you're teaching fairy tales at MIT rather than science and engineering. <laughs> uh, actually, could, could we get a, uh, I'll start an answer, but could we get a microphone back to John Parsons in the back? So he may want to respond to some of these economic uh, issues as well. Um, so Tom, the, we actually do uh, discuss that. I guess we are not, um, uh, we don't feel quite so certain uh, about the trajectory of the cost differences of light water reactors and fast reactors. I think, frankly, we don't have all that much experience, and uh, um, uh, your, your, your statements have some basis, uh, but, but, uh, but of limited, very limited here. So, so, anyway, so, th so that is an issue, and indeed, um, uh, an issue that we will certainly be pointing out is that for example, take this case of the uranium-fed fast reactors, if one goes that route, right? On the one hand, that removes a constraint at the rate at which you could build fast reactors, but you may not be so eager unless the cost gets under control. So, so th those factors are, are, uh, are certainly in there. I guess our view is that it's a long way to really understanding uh, what those costs will be in the, long, in the longer term. Uh, John, did you, did you want to add uh, comments on that? John, John again, was, did, did a lot of the economic analysis. Great. So let me just say a couple of things. First of all, we do have an economic analysis. Is your microphone on, John? Yeah, I think so. Okay. We do have an economic analysis in the study, yeah. not just of the cost of uranium, but of the costs, uh, the full costs of these different fuel cycles. And the preliminary report behind what's in the study uh, 
is already on the website uh, at MIT. Uh, so it's there. In the study, though, we will emphasize, as Ernie just did a moment ago, that the, cost, the capital costs for a fast reactor and the costs for reprocessing are extremely uncertain, just as Ernie was mentioning. We only have a little bit of experience with them. And so that, uh, that we, we do the analysis, we have the numbers, but the question is, what is future research going to shape in terms of the capital costs for fast reactors and in terms of reprocessing technology? That's, people can put a number on that now, but what the future will be is really going to be determined by future research. And in fact, let me just add to, and to reinforce, Tom, that what really is, in the end, our main point. I mean, the, these studies about which fuel cycles could go, what the dynamics would be, uh, clearly economics, are, uh, I mean, as you well know, we always view the economics of these choices as being quite crucial. But in the end, what we're saying is there is a lot of uncertainty in the costs of these technologies, in the drivers of nuclear power deployment, in the uh, nature of the technologies, which many of which can have strong policy implications, uh, et cetera. But in our view, the good news is that we actually have time to do a much more serious exploration of that space. Uh, than we have historically, and certainly in the last years we've had very, very little work, frankly, uh, on, the on the relevant issues. So our, our view is, in fact, we are not favorable. My, I had a last line on my, on my last slide that said demonstration, something like demonstration projects can be considered in time. And in time means after we have explored this reasonable technology space, get some indication about where economics and engineering performance uh, are, are headed. So really our view in the end is, look, I think that these, these uh, fuel cycle simulations, I think, bring out some important messages that have not been emphasized, like, for example, in any of these fuel cycles, things like transuranics are not magically changed in terms of their total inventory. Uh, uranium uses are not, is not magically changed uh, in this. Uh, in this. Uh, but what actually gets deployed will depend upon the answers to your, to your questions. And we should use the time in our view effectively uh, I, I to would, provide them. I would like to add one, one point to that. One of the conclusions we came to is that you don't need a high conversion ratio for a sustainable fuel cycle. You can go from 1.2 to 1.3 down to 1.0. Why is that important? If you want a high conversion ratio breeder reactor, you're talking about a sodium-cooled fast reactor, the traditional pathway toward a sustainable reactor. If you bring the conversion ratio down to about one, you have at least four reactor options of which the sodium-cooled fast reactor is one, but another one is a hard spectrum light water reactor. That is a light water reactor with a slightly modified core. And there are also two other, two other options. Because you changed the ground rules, the goal from a conversion ratio of 1.2 or 1.3 to 1, you opened up the option space. And it is my personal belief that when we start looking at some of those options, we're going to find that some of those options have substantially lower economic costs than the traditional vision of a uh, fast reactor or a sustainable fuel cycle. It's changing the ground rules, changes the choices of technology, changes the economics. Question there. Sharon Squassoni from CSIS. Um, I usually look at this from a perspective of nonproliferation. And one of the problems we've had over the years is convincing other countries to follow our lead. And so while what you say is very reasonable about uh, these uh, sustaining uh, reactors, most of the countries that are uh, looking at fast reactors now have already sunk billions of dollars into reprocessing. So do you have any thoughts on how to convince those countries to choose one technology over another? Okay, well, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, uh, first of all, I am not a 
great believer in the power of the arguments of following our lead. First of all, there's good historical evidence on my side, uh, and, uh, uh, but I just don't think that that's uh, uh, a logical approach, particularly in the modern, in the modern world, uh, where there are lots of nuclear supplier countries, lots of countries that move forward in, in various directions, and frankly, um, a, a perhaps unpleasant uh, fact, and I'll, I'll come back to the proliferation, but I'm, on this leadership issue, why I don't really uh, put much stock in that uh, is that, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the days when some might have had the illusion that that would be an effective argument, I would argue it was coupled to the fact that we were also a very, very large market for technologies. I don't mean only nuclear, energy technologies, other technologies. Uh, it was easy to be a technology leader when you had an enormous domestic market. Uh, we face, and I'm not talking now again only nuclear, I'll come back to that, but I think right now there's a big issue about being technology leaders or technology takers uh, as we look at the energy technology path forward. Uh, now, so going back to nuclear, so what do we do? Uh, uh, I think that uh, we, have to pr we have to present a real value proposition. In fact, our, our view, and there'll be more about this in the full report, uh, is that when it comes to something like fuel leasing, I said some version of fuel leasing, the version that we prefer uh, is one that is based upon, first of all, commercial contracts to the extent possible, always backed up by a hierarchy of, uh, of institutional uh, and increasingly international uh, uh, coverages for security supply, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, financial incentives, um, and they can be creative. Uh, in a paper we published in 1994, uh, I just mentioned with the current Deputy Secretary of Energy, uh, the, uh, uh, for example, we noted that uh, one might combine climate and uh, proliferation concerns with a way of attaching carbon credits to new nuclear construction in countries that took certain kinds of agreements around uh, enrichment and reprocessing. We also argued that we should seek these agreements for finite periods of time, maybe 10 years at a time, renewable, so there is no issue of giving up birthrights to, to enrichment technologies, to use an example. Right? So I think there are many things that we have done, or could do, excuse me, that could do that would be more about presenting a value proposition to countries, particularly with small programs, as opposed to carrying on with an illusion of follow what we're doing, especially since we tend to be very inconsistent in what we're doing, uh, particularly in the international proliferation sphere where, I'm sorry, I, my, my, many of my friends may be, opposed, may be offended, but Let's face it, we're all over the map. So. Thank you. Matt Wald, New York Times. Uh, would we be driven, should we be driven to reprocessing to reduce the longevity of waste and the toxicity of waste as was given under the GNEP proposal? And does this mean we can finally stop worrying about thorium? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, ultimately we know that we are likely to need the recycled fuel in order to increase the fuel resources. And um, we don't need to rush it, and our report. Uh, emphasizes there is time to therefore develop uh, the uh, processes that are needed in order to uh, get uh, the best uh, features, whether it's uh, economics, uh, security, and so forth. So uh, uh, the answer to, your, to the first part of your question is uh, 
uh, we certainly should be engaged in uh, looking at the options and uh, trying to see uh, how we can evolve into uh, better selections for the future. Um, not necessarily into deployment, but uh, certainly in an R&D, and if necessary, um, uh, you know, larger scale. Um, the second part of your question with regards to thorium is, uh, while it's not necessarily directly addressed in the report, um, in the append yeah, there is one appendix uh, on thorium. We point out uh, that uh, th th there are uh, good things and bad things about it, but that uh, with the uh, advantages, uh, you get complications that uh, uh, will not make it um, attractive in the short term, as long as we have plut the uranium-plutonium cycle. Um, the uh, main advantage usually that's pointed out for thorium is we don't produce as much plutonium in the cycle. Uh, very often, however, uh, the same uh, people who argue for it discount the presence of the uranium-233, which is uh, just as uh, fissionable a material, although uh, you know, it may have uh, more uh, radiation associated with its extraction. So if you, if you look just from the point of view of what you get for complicating the cycle by looking at uh, thorium when we have uh, plenty of uranium. Uh, we, we don't think it's an easy uh, fuel to introduce in the marketplace for some time. Can I add just one, uh, uh, one footnote to, to, to the question, to the answer to Sharon, uh, which is that uh, I said it earlier, but just to repeat it, it bears repeating, because the value propositions that I was talking about are complicated by our inability to manage our waste. It constrains our actions. And uh, then to Matt's question, uh, just to add one other comment, and uh, it, we didn't make a big point about it in this summary report, but we should emphasize that uh, we have often, cause this goes back to the first question, that we have often equated reprocessing and recycling. And we also would argue that there is a possibility in the future, again, we don't know, uh, until this is looked at more carefully, but there could also be a motivation to reprocess or partition the spent fuel, even if you don't recycle, for waste management reasons. Uh, we we are often accused as having a fetish on deep boreholes. Uh, the uh, but for example, uh, you could imagine a very very small package that you could extract for a deep borehole disposal as a waste management. Uh, 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 approach. So it's again, we just think there are lots of options that haven't been, been explored, and I will say in favor of boreholes. At least this is a case where the size of the package actually matters, uh, as, opposed, <laughs> as opposed to a repository. <laughs> right. <laughs> refer to time as uh, available, lots of it. In other words, no rush. We have about 100 years to develop uh, closing the fuel cycle. But the other side of the energy community, the environmental side, tells us that we will be in big trouble with climate change by the middle of this century. The population will be 50% greater. And we will not have solved very many problems. We'll be dithering, I think. And by 2100, people like James Lovelock tell us we could have a tough time. We could all be in a different uh, community of life. Thank you. Uh, so let, let me, let's just clarify uh, two points. Uh, uh, first of all, let's, I, I can't speak for the group on this. It wasn't part of our conversation, but I personally at least uh, think we're in trouble with climate change right now. Uh, uh, and uh, But we should distinguish the issue of nuclear power plant construction as a carbon, more or less carbon-free source versus what one does in some sense with the back end. So and in fact, if you remember, our first statement on our first slide was get on with the job of first mover plant construction as that is the critical gate 
if there is or is not to be uh, an expansion of nuclear power in the United States. Secondly, just to clarify, uh, uh, we don't want our statement, we have time, to be taken in the wrong way. Uh, we mean we have time before we commit to any of these major new fuel cycles, but we don't have time to make those decisions properly in a relevant time frame unless we start with serious exploration of the technology space in a way that we have not done before and start that very, very soon. So, so don't get us wrong on that. We, we, we're not saying just exhale and sit back. Uh, we're saying you've got to be aggressive now in looking at what is a much bigger option space as with uh, Char Charles was emphasizing, relaxing some of the constraints that we've had and how we think about it we have a lot more options that may be a lot more attractive in the future. Uh, starting here. Uh, Pete Baer with Climate Wire. Um, taking a subject that's come up at the President's uh, Blue Ribbon uh, panel, uh, how realistic are the choices for uh, a centralized uh, interim storage? And uh, does the Yucca Mountain history undermine uh, public confidence in a serious way uh, about the options for centralized storage? If so, what should we do with Yucca Mountain? Mr. Charles, do you want to try some of that? <laughs> <laughs> One of the points we point out is that uh, we in the United States cited a geological repository called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant for certain types of defense transuronic waste. Uh, the Swedes and the Finns have developed sites uh, for repositories with public acceptance. In the Swedish case, of course, two communities were competing for the repository. The French look like they're fairly close. In addition, there are a half dozen geological repositories in Europe for hazardous chemical waste. So the issue isn't whether you can cite a geological repository. Lots of people have been doing that. The question is how you do it. And we observed, as, as we listed in one of the earlier slides, the characteristics of programs that are successful and the observation that those characteristics are not seen in U.S. programs. And you know, our central recommendation in here is, is that uh, let's take a look at what people have had success in, in the United States, such as the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant and overseas, and f form our programs with the characteristics that match those that actually work. Now, let's, let's learn from experience. That's, that's the bottom line. And I, I don't think it's a mission impossible. Uh, it, it does imply, however, major changes in how we approach waste management and major, major changes in how you cite a centralized storage facility over the traditional uh, let's draft somebody strategy. I would just make another point, Pete, uh, that um, look, I, I look, we're, we're not I mean, in this, our, our report is not about getting into the specifics of uh, the current Yucca Mountain uh, debates. I mean, we certainly state that geological isolation is absolutely required uh, in, in the future. Um, uh, but would add that the, the idea of consolidated uh, central storage, we recognize, uh, also has the kinds of challenges that you, uh, you mentioned. And we've seen that with the, for example, the ongoing saga uh, with the Utah uh, uh, proposal. Um, uh, which was NRC approved, but has other, <laughs> the local communities were not uh, adequately engaged, uh, perhaps. Um, uh, but I think as we think about a few of those sites, let's face it, we have to think about what is, uh, let's call it a architecture for um, uh, fuel cycle facilities in the United States. Uh, and uh, one can certainly imagine in the near term, if our recommendations on R, D, and D were followed, uh, that there could be some logic in coupling serious new research, research infrastructure in the relatively near term uh, uh, with those, uh, with those uh, storage sites. And then if decades down the road that were to develop into a large reprocessing infrastructure, there would, there's clearly a logic for having kind of major, a few major fuel cycle parks. But those are, those are discussions that are beyond technical analysis, uh, shall we say, and uh, uh, need to be discussed politically. Uh, let's see, we were, uh, yes, it was here, and then there, and then there, and then, right. <laughs>
Um, Michael Lowenthal with the National Academies. Uh, this may give you an opportunity to elaborate a little bit on an earlier answer that you gave. Um, you said that the system, all the pieces of the system depend on each other. A choice you make in one place affects all of the other pieces. In nuclear, the a facility is a big commitment. It's a big capital investment. It's a commitment over a long period of time. You s cited periods of 50 to 100 years. Uh, but goals and circumstances and technologies change over that time period. Does this create a sort of constrained future? That seems sort of an unforgiving kind of circumstance. And I, I wonder how we should think about deployment of nuclear power within uh, a world that works that way, a technology system that works that way. Do we, do we have to have facilities that are extra flexible? Mujit? Um, you know, I think that um, in, uh, th this is a feature that affects uh, practically all energy uh, production uh, technologies. Um, coal plants and other plants, you, you know, the investment is such that you want it to operate for decades and uh, society uh, changes its perceptions of what the issues are and what environmental quality means and so forth. So I think that the changing environment is a, uh, a fact of life that one has uh, to work with. Uh, and in planning for the future, even with uh, nuclear power, uh, it is wise to expect a tightening of the environmental quality needed in the products. Uh, and uh, that, that is one way to deal with it. Um, but um, if you're saying, should we invent things that are, for example, mobile, so that if uh, uh, the society in, uh, let's say, Arizona wants to uh, ship uh, some of the production means across the borders to another state, it's a little bit too cumbersome to come to deal with it. Uh, and I don't think it will uh, actually uh, facilitate a a wider uh, uh, in investment in this technology. Although I would point out that the Russians have uh, convinced themselves that uh, uh, reactors on barges are a way uh, to produce uh, electricity that can be moved from one location to the other. But so far, the market hasn't seen many orders. Um, I, I would, maybe I'll add two things. Uh, one, one, of course, is that, uh, again, in. <laughs> Uh, in a way that has not characterized discussion in, in the nuclear industry or the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, this, this value of options, I think, remains very important. And, of course, <laughs> the value of the whole point of the, of the options is you would like to maintain your options at low cost for as long as possible to make a good decision. That's one point. The second point is that, in the end, when you integrate, the really big money is, is in the nuclear reactors, right? I mean, a, a, a nuclear processing plant, you know, Rakasho can cost a lot of money, but it's also servicing 40 reactors, uh, you know. Uh, and, and one of the uh, a disadvantage of nuclear, clearly, uh, which I think is behind your question a little bit, is the enormous uh, capital, uh, capital commitment that's made. But the other side of the coin is if you build your reactor on budget uh, and on schedule, uh, et cetera, once you've produced it, it's going to dispatch because it also has a very, very low marginal cost. So, you know, generally, you know, you build a nuclear reactor and you operate it well, um, it's going to produce a steady stream of income. <laughs> um, so, I, I don't know. I, and I think if you have the reactors and then there are the policies that are or are not requiring, let's say, a recycling strategy, well, that becomes an essential service to this very, very large capital installed base. So I, I'm not sure that's the, the, main, the main issue, in my view. I, let me add uh, one thing, actually. Uh, uh, there was a project at MIT recently that looked at the flexibility of the fast reactors to change its conversion ratio within the same plant. And indeed, one could start, let's say, with uh, uh, at the time when uh, plutonium is desirable with a higher conversion ratio. And if society said, no, we want to get rid of it, you can change the core into a design that consumes uh, the plutonium. So to some extent, uh, 
it is possible to adapt to the requirements uh, around you uh, that you cannot uh, start by addressing from the beginning. And finally, I just mentioned that one, one of the students on the, on the project, Lara Pierpoint, actually her PhD thesis is looking at trying to develop the methodology for understanding decision making in the complex interface of private and public interests that would be present in advanced fuel cycle development. There's a question over there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's Christopher Payne with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, I didn't see, I may have overlooked it, but I didn't see any reference in your uh, current report to the standardization goal uh, that originally informed the 2010 program. And uh, is that because you, you believe that that would not ultimately affect the economics of uh, deploying advanced LWRs? I mean, there are, five, there are five designs in the U.S. market now. If the South Koreans come in, there'll be six. And it seems as though the opportunity for any one supplier to gain this kind of scale that would really drive down costs on a unit basis do doesn't seem to be present the more suppliers you add to the market. Yeah, uh, so if we get a microphone to John Parsons there. Also, let, let, before John, let me just say that I think, you know, th that, that question is very important, Chris, but uh, our focus was more on the fuel cycle issues, and so we did not address that quite so explicitly. But John can... Uh, yeah, when we have discussed the ones through fuel cycle and LWRs, we certainly support the idea of standardization. Uh, I think the question is not so much imposing a requirement that there only be one design in the United States, but rather supporting the idea that there be, as with the current licensing system, the option to license the design once and have anybody who orders that design not ask for 250 changes specific to their individual site. That's a problem that still is trying to be worked through in the industry today. And we agree that trying to push that standardization is essential to the economics of keeping the capital costs down, getting the construction done on time and on budget. But it's, we don't wanna, you, we shouldn't confuse requiring, imposing on the market one design as opposed to allowing standardized designs to compete and maybe one ends up dominating. The problem in the US in the past was that each individual utility at each individual site asked for specifications unique to their site. That ha that's what has to stop in order for construction to be done in a disciplined fashion. International investor, uh, we just uh, issued a report on nuclear Asia, and by our casual observation, we note six new nations are actively planning, developing, and building nuclear facilities. We also noted that none of these were homegrown technologies, almost every one of them working with an outside partner, where both the skill set, technology transfer, and very large, the financing was being supplied from outside their individual nations. We're in an era of low cost capital. So on this question of economics, we didn't see the decision making being guided at all by the economics of the issue, but rather by other strategic consideration. And t more to my question then, we also didn't see the intensive concerns with the fuel cycle at the, at the outer edge of this. In other words, globally, when you look, do you just see that this is more of a Western and a developed nation concern rather than a uh, concern of the many other nations that are starting to experiment with this? <laughs> Let me uh, take this uh, question to at least uh, point out um, the fact that uh, uh, the, the waste problem uh, is a problem of uh, isolation of radioactivity in the long term. One uh, doesn't uh, feel, at least I don't feel, that the public is also told that uh, uh, the total uh, waste or spent fuel produced by a single uh, plant uh, over 60 years of operation can be stored in dry casks 
within three acres. Over 60 years of operation, one plant can uh, store the fuel in three acres. So uh, when new countries consider nuclear, and uh, they probably consider that what's important for them is to be able to deal with this, either locally, and if it's only three acres, they might be able to find the land until there is a regional or an international agreement to uh, facilitate uh, taking uh, that uh, spent fuel and uh, either disposing of it or reprocessing it. Um, I, I'm somewhat familiar with the UAE model, and I think they preserve both options in their planning for the future. I mean, to be honest, I, I, this is a gross uh, generalization, but uh, I think in many of those countries you're referring to, it's not clear that the waste management pathway has been particularly deeply thought through. <laughs> I hope that was subtle enough. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to go over here. Uh, Alan, uh, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. and, uh, and then we'll come back. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a bit in the back of the question, and then we'll come back over here. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, the, there's much to be appreciated in this study. Uh, I, but I'd like to address uh, your subtitle, uh, Interdisciplinary, because uh, it appears to be a very good engineering study. What I seem to be seeing at a quick glance is a lack of uh, interdisciplinary considerations. Uh, for example, the, the, uh, the decision about whether or not to recycle has never been driven any place that I'm aware of by a belief that we're running out of uranium. It's been uh, driven by other policy-related decisions, uh, political, security, religious, uh, whatever you want to call it. So I'd like to ask, uh, to what extent you... Uh, you associate countries with those motivations? <laughs> <laughs> uh, countries will go unnamed. <laughs> but, so I'd like to ask uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the extent to which uh, the uh, other departments of MIT, your, uh, your incredible social sciences department of humanities, contributed to the study. Related to that is uh, the, uh, the statement that you make in here th that uh, we don't know if spent fuel is a, uh, a waste or a resource. And there seems to be an implication that someday a light bulb is going to go off and it'll be obvious that it's one or the other. Again, there's a lack of historical perspective. Uh, in every country that I know of, the country has made a policy decision first to declare the spent fuel a waste or to declare it to be a resource, and then to make the engineering and the fuel cycle decisions based on that declaration. And so uh, if we're waiting for somehow uh, the, somebody to come along and all of a sudden uh, everybody's going to come to a consensus, waste versus resource, I think we're going to have a long wait. We, we advocate a wait. Uh, the, uh, and to answer your first question, uh, Steve Ansolaby here is a political scientist and uh, could discuss uh, his work in public attitudes. Uh, John Parsons, who's there, is an economist, uh, uh, and I'm uh, completely a mess. Um, but I'm not an engineer. <laughs> uh, so, look, I, I think we, well, okay, we, this is, uh, uh, this study is, uh, frankly, is more engineering grounded than some of the other studies that, that we have done. Uh, we think that was kind of fit to purpose for uh, our, the scope of our study. So. I, I would like to make one uh, comment about this uh, waste versus resources, uh, which I think is actually how the real world is going to ultimately progress. Uh, you know, there's uranium all over the world, and what we do is we mine the uranium in the, uh, that has high ore assay, or there's a lot of it, and we can get at it. If it's in the middle of the Arctic Circle, we sort of ignore it. And I think when you start talking about spent fuel over the very long term, what you're going to have is a similar situation, ultimately. You will recycle spent fuel with a high fissile assay that's easy to reprocess. And there will be some spent fuel you say, low fissile assay, really a problem fuel. It's going to be trash. So I think if economics has anything to say about this, we're going to end up somewhere in between where there will be a, some categories of spent fuel that get reprocessed and some categories of spent fuel where the answer is bad idea. I don't think you're going to actually end up with, my personal perspective, I don't think you're going to end up with a yes, no answer. I think you're going to end up with, uh, depending upon what's in a specific fuel assembly. And, and with different answers in different countries as we already have, frankly. Yeah. Uh, so, so let, me, let me add to your okay. previous answer to Alan. 
Uh, one of the names out there is John Deutsch. Oh, I he's, a, he's an institute professor. <laughs> he can institute. be in any department. He can be in any department. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot John. I don't, I don't, I'm, yes, of course. Right. Which, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, this question, and then I'm going to ask also if there are any call-in questions uh, from from distributed press. But let's no. Anybody know? Okay, but let's start here anyway with this question. Yeah. Oh no, no. no uh, I'm sorry. The gentleman that's standing was I think I think was first. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Henry. Okay. <laughs> uh, Henry Sikulski with the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center. Yeah, I noticed on page X, the word economics is actually in bold. And uh, since you hail from Massachusetts, where the original Tea Party occurred, I thought it would be appropriate <laughs> Where are you going, to, think, Henry, with this? <laughs> to think a little bit about economics. And you make a statement here. You say, well, 7 to 10 need incentives. But that's for reactors. And then you say, we believe the nuclear energy, that nuclear energy should be able to compete on the open market, as should other energy options. Amen. We very do. good, very good. Now, two questions then. How much in the way of loan guarantees do you want to have out there for those seven to 10 plants? Please give me a number. Second, how do you use the market with regard to this back end? You seem to argue elsewhere in this report that you think the federal government should be heavily involved. Walk us through how you're going to use market mechanisms to make things disciplined with regard to this back end, would you? Uh, I don't know, John, I don't know if you want to comment on some of these uh, economic issues, but well, let, let me just say, Henry, that on the, uh, well, the first question, uh, on the loan guarantees, uh, again, in 2003, we recommended uh, uh, financial, financial incentives for the order of, let's call it 10, 10 plants. Uh, the uh, principle that we put forward was that we felt the amount of coverage or amount of incentive should basically cover real first mover additional costs. That has not been reflected uh, in the uh, Legislation uh, as it is being being implemented. Too high, too low. Well, uh, uh, the uh, uh, given number, the principle that we put forward uh, in 2003 would have led to substantially lower, uh, uh, at least tax incentives, uh, than uh, are being covered by the loan guarantees. But it's a very very different instrument. Uh, that, that we had recommended. So uh, I, I'm really not going to give a, a specific number. Uh, but, sorry? It was two to 300 million. Two to 300 million, that's right. But, okay. uh, no, no, but, but, you know, but Tom, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll give that number. So we said two to 300 million, but that was in the context of an, a production tax credit. Uh, so a loan guarantee is obviously different, and it would cover a higher fraction of the cost. Uh, I, my concern is driving it to such a high level uh, that there is not adequate risk sharing uh, in, in the private sector partner. Uh, that's something that can be argued. Yeah. I, I hope you work on that. That would be an interesting. That would be John Parsons will work on that. You can talk with him. Right. Right. Uh, I was hoping to say I already forgot the uh, rest of the question. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, I, I think the issue is, look, well, again, I, and not all my, I mean, my colleagues could give their own opinion, but uh, it, it seems to me in the end that uh, if we are to move towards these kind of more advanced closed fuel cycles, sooner rather than later, and by sooner, again, I don't mean in 20 years, but, but not a century, if that's to, to occur, my feeling is it will occur based upon requirements judged as important for waste management. And if that's the case, then the policy structure has to be put in, put in place in the government. There would be regulations to be met. 
and then the private sector uh, can risk its capital to execute the program. John, if you want to come. Yeah, just on this question of uh, whether nuclear should compete economically and how do you deal with the government on the back end, I think there's a little bit of a false dichotomy between the government having a significant role and whether there's competition economically. In every industry, the government has to define the acceptable solutions, has to define the requirements for safety and waste management and things of that sort. And uh, there's no reason why that's at odds with ultimately companies doing the economics, companies managing the process inside the system that's defined by the government. And there's certainly a role in technologies such as this one for the government to do certain amounts of research at the front end and to understand the system so that it can properly define the rules and the space and the waste regulations within which uh, uh, companies will operate. Charles described systems for a successful waste management system which include in the specifications that Charles provided opportunities for the systems to be managed in a commercially responsible fashion. Those two things do not have to be at odds. I am going to uh, I have to apologize and say that I think it's 3 o'clock and, um, uh, and ask, uh, uh, we really appreciate the interest and, the and more questions, uh, but we will be here for another hour or so. There's a reception and uh, we'd love to engage uh, in, in, in discussion. Thank you very, very much for your attention.